welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined as always by Chris Bouguet. Hey, Chris. Hey, Rachel. What's going on? Not much. I am really excited to have a really practical banter today. We're going to talk about resources you can start using tomorrow. Actually, you could probably start using them today, depending on what time of day this is. Maybe you're on your morning commute, driving into work, and you could use some of these resources. So we wanted to take some time and uh, share some resources with you. Now, there's something else special about these resources, but maybe maybe we save what's special about them to the end of the banter. Love it. We'll see if people can guess what's special. The first resource that I, that I wanted to share is a website um, called wombo.ai. Now, if anyone has been following me on Facebook or Instagram, have you noticed that I've been on Instagram more? I have noticed, Chris. Let's take just a second and talk about it because I'm like... Who is Chris Bouguet right now? He's just like posting a couple times a week. <laughs> I'm really impressed. I'm loving it. Yeah. I, I, I think I might be your biggest fan on Instagram. I, you might be. You might be. There's uh, It's sort of like a New Year's thing. I'm going to try and be on Instagram more. But I, I had posted a wombo.ai that I had created. And you may have seen these before, um, but Wombo creates a bunch of different stuff. Um, one of them was a... What I uploaded was a picture of, of, of young Chris uh, back when I was maybe in fourth grade or so. Uh, these big giant glasses. I can't even remember. I might have had my little shark tooth necklace that I used to wear back in fourth grade because, you know, I was cool. And but it was what Wombo does is it takes that picture and you put it with music. And so uh, and then it animates that picture so that it looks like that that picture is singing the music uh, or singing the song, right? And so the song that I had was from Rick Astley, um, Never Gonna Give You Up, right? From the Rick Roll that we, from, from, from back in the day. Um, but it was super fun. It was super fun to make, super engaging. Um, in fact, I posed a question on Facebook about like, how do you think you could use this uh, for language? And the one and only Gail Van Tatenhove wrote a whole thing on the Facebook group, um, a whole like response, like five different ways you could use it with song lyrics. And uh, I hope I'm not uh, ratting her out here, but she um, she made one herself of her singing and sent it to me in an email. I don't know if she's ever going to post it. You know, if you, if you see her uh, around, ask her, right? Say, hey, where, are you ever going to post what you shared with Chris? Because uh, it, it made me laugh out loud. A video of Gail, a static image of her that this AI has uh, contorted to make her sing. Uh, it was super fun. I wanted to, first of all, it's awesome that Gail is engaging <laughs> and creating these things and sending them to you. I feel like we've hit celebrity status with this podcast uh, because Gail is amazing and obviously very well known in the field. Um, the one thing I was going to add is that, are you familiar with the app My Talking Pet? No, I don't think I am. Okay. So it's a similar concept, but you basically upload a a photo of a pet. And so like you could be doing this with a student and get everyone to submit, um, you know, a picture of their pet. And then you make this pet talk and you decide what he says and you can record it. And it's super, super fun and engaging. Um, so if you guys haven't checked out my talking pet, it's a, it's a fan favorite. I love that. I love that. That sounds like another resource that's similar is called chatter picks, where you take a picture and then you draw a line where a mouth should go and then it animates that mouth. So very similar. Uh, but back to Wombo for a second. So Wombo also has a free website so that it's not part of the mobile app. And if you go onto the website, uh, something you can do is you can type in a term, right? So I typed in the term assistive technology, but could it be any word, right? Um, and then you make some choices and the AI, when I say AI, I mean artificial intelligence, creates an image based on that text. So for instance, I created it, uh, if you type in assistive technology, and then you make some choices about what style do you want it in, um, and then it will uh, create this own piece of artwork, which again is sort of an interesting take on like, what if you typed in some core vocabulary? How would that, how would the AI interpret the different core vocabulary words and what images would it create? And then what kind of conversations would you have around those images? let alone anything a student might come up with, you know, let's type it in here and, and let's see what the computer says and let's see what, how they draw it. You know, I think it would be a, I think it is sort of a, a super fun way to engage and empower students. Okay. What other tools you have for me? I'm excited. Okay. I'm going to, I'm like really taking notes so I can use some of these in my sessions. So 
That was Wombo AI, right? Okay, so the next one I want to share with you is not really a tool so much as a video, one specific video. And this specific video, um, we've actually referenced this teacher before. You, you go back in the archives, you can listen to this, uh, this story that I tell of talking to an earth science teacher, and she was telling me all about how she was uh, trying to use the communication device for a student that she had in her class, this high school earth science teacher. And it was at, um, uh, I think it was prom or something. Melissa had taken me to, and I was like chaperoning, and I was sitting next to the earth science teacher, and I started to describe to her about descriptive teaching. Well, she took that to heart. She ended up making all these index cards, and I did record a video with her that is called Descriptive Teaching in Science, and we posted that up to our LCPS AT YouTube page, and it's all, it's a video of her sharing how she creates index cards with what we call, um, uh, tier three words, right? Or really, really fringy words, you know? She writes that on one side, and then on the other side of the of the index card is how she descriptively teaches that, right? Um, and she describes how she uses it in her class and how to the benefit of all the students, not just students that use AAC. I love this idea. I also was just talking about descriptive teaching to, I did an overlap with a teacher of one of my clients, and it was like mind blown when I started explaining this concept of descriptive teaching to this teacher and like you could see that her wheels were totally spinning. So I feel like that would be a, a great extension to send. You know, obviously like there's no resource out there that has every single word you might encounter with all of the potential core vocabulary used to describe it. But I feel like what it sounds like this video does, it illustrates the concept and gives ideas to kind of spark teachers and paraprofessionals to start thinking through that lens of descriptive teaching. Yes. And what's so powerful about this video is that it's a general ed earth science teacher, right? It's not a speech language pathologist. It's not you or me or someone else that works in the field of AAC. It's an actual teacher that's in the, in the trenches working with students on earth science uh, using this strategy. So I feel like that's really a powerful way to, uh, I always find, say the, the, the phrase, you know, find your champions, use them as uh, uh, to illustrate what works, right? And she's a perfect example of that. Okay, Chris, what other resources? Keep them coming. We don't have a ton of time left, but I still want more. Okay, here's, here's another one, all right? We gotta give a quick shout out. This is another video. It's less about the video and more about the action behind the video. The shout out is to Fairfax County School Board. Fairfax County is our neighboring county. So if you picture Virginia, Virginia looks like a triangle. And at the top of that triangle is Loudoun. And right next to the uh, east of us, right before you get to Washington, D.C., is Fairfax County. And I have many friends that work in Fairfax County, get together with them uh, virtually and share resources and ideas and strategies. But Fairfax County, that school board, passed a resolution back in October recognizing AAC Awareness Month. And so that's their school board. Uh, actually, you know, talking about AAC, recognizing it. Uh, there's a whole, uh, I think, maybe 15 minute segment where they're talking about what AAC means to them and how important it is. And, and because they recognize it now, every year moving forward, it'll be recognized as AAC Awareness Month. And it was just a, uh, Fairfax is the 10th largest school district in the United States. So for them to take that step and uh, share that in that sort of format and really adopt it the way they did. Uh, it just kind of says, you know what, we can all do this. I love that. I love that. And do you think this is something that, you know, individual clinicians and teachers could be advocating for in their districts? A hundred percent. They can say, well, if this school board did it, can we do that? Could that be your uh, task this year? Your, um, your what you what you take on as your challenge is say, can I get my school board to adopt AAC Awareness Month, like uh, officially recognize it? Uh, and they could pass some resolution that will always be recognized every year. Uh, yeah, it sounds like really doable. If Fairfax did it, anybody could do it. Yeah, and we really need that. We need that education and that awareness because. Half of the roadblock is people don't know what AAC is and how important it is. So, I mean, that's why we do this podcast, right, Chris? Like, that's we want to inform people. We want to educate. We want to really increase the awareness around it. And I feel like there's no better way than kind of starting at the top and trying to advocate for something like AAC Awareness Month. That feels like a whole thing. And something that, you know, really 
can grow over time. It's not like one and done, like, okay, now we've, we've recognized it. It's like every year you can figure out ways to teach and build awareness around this um, in a systematic way that's not just like, you know, lone SLPs out there trying to like get people to listen, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, so Rachel, do we have time for one more, maybe two more, or what do you think? One more, Chris. One more. Are you sure we can't do two more? Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it after this one. Let's see how fast I can talk about this. I'll keep this into a bite-sized segment because it's talking about the resource Biteable. So Biteable.com is one of those video generators where you uh, it gives you templates with like little animations and you can choose the different templates you want to use and different font styles and you can type in text and add little video but it helps you create this really professional video. And I recently uh, had to create one of these uh, illustrating what our assistive technology team is and who are um, the people that I work with, what we do. And so I put together this little short video using Biteable and I found it really uh, easy. You know, I just used the free version. Um, easy to put together. And I'm just curious if anyone out there is using Biteable as well. Love this. Biteable feels like another, I, I'm, I really am taking notes. Sorry, Rachel. So uh, there's, there's something weird happened there in the recording. Um, we were hacked, maybe? Have you heard about the strategy hacker? It's been happening recently. So our friend Mo Booty, right? Did you know about this? So Mo Booty presents every year at Closing the Gap. Did I? Did you know about this? The what happened at her presentation at no. Closing the Gap? No. So she was doing this presentation and someone hacked into her presentation and shared a strategy. The person called himself the strategy hacker, um, wore a mask over his face, like not like a, a COVID mask, not like, a, like, like uh, I think it was like a Cthulhu mask, you know, like um, this knitted mask with tendrils and tentacles, right? Um, but hacked in and shared resources of his own, like Busted right into Mo's presentation and shared resources of his own. I think it was all about coding um, and going to code.org and Hour of Code to share about um, the Star Wars. In fact, it was the same um, website, uh, the Star Wars one that I showed at ASHA, right? So this guy hacked into Mo's site. Yeah, so you got to watch out for that. Sometimes that happens, Rachel, when people hack into sites. I'm scared. I don't know if that video is public anywhere, but there is a place where you can find all of these resources. Can you can you fathom the guess where these resources might be kept? Where where you might have seen a curated list of these resources? Drum roll, please. Bada, 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 bada. <laughs> it's in our Patreon, Chris. It's in our Patreon. We are constantly sharing resources and therapy ideas in our Patreon. And those are just some of the ones that we've actually posted to Patreon, but there's so many more. Absolutely, absolutely. We happened to get a recording of that strategy hacker, put it up in Patreon. That video that I created from Biteable, it's up there in Patreon. The video of the uh, teacher that is from the Earth Science is there. The Fairfax video is there. Uh, now, all, uh, many of that stuff you can find out on the web, but the fact that it's curated here and it comes to your e inbox is maybe one of the valuable reasons you might consider signing up for Patreon. The other thing is I actually share resources that are paid resources on my site for free in Patreon. Um, you know, I'm constantly trying to think about how we can how we can give to that Patreon because those people who pay for our Patreon really help support this podcast. And without them, we would not be able to do it. And so we're just forever grateful to all of our Patreon members. We know them well at this point, Chris. We have our Talking With Tech Lives with Patreon. And um, it's just really, we're so grateful that we have um, those people who sign up. And we would love for you to join our Patreon. If you are thinking about it, you go to patreon.com backslash talking with tech, and you'll be able to access years at this point of content um, and resources and podcast episodes that we didn't air or bites of podcast episodes or behind the scenes. Um, so there's so much in there. And Chris, I want to take a take a minute. We're going to shout out all of our new Patreon members. That's like a thing we're doing now, right? Absolutely. I cannot wait to hear them. You ready, Chris? I'm ready. There's kind of a lot. Um, okay. So we have Megan, Sherry, Elizabeth, Jennifer, Jacqueline and Joanna. Um, Joanna, she's based in the UK because I see a little pound next to hers. <laughs> so that's exciting. Um, so yeah, those are all people who have joined our Patreon and we want to give you a special shout out. Thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we hope you enjoy it. Um, and if you guys want to sign up, patreon.com backslash talking with tech. So Rachel, what about the interview today? 
Okay, Chris, our interview is part two, right, of the Chris Brock interview. So you guys had so much to say about gifts that we had to split it into two episodes. Absolutely. All right. So without further ado, let's listen to part two of my interview with Chris Brock. Hey there. If you love listening to this podcast, we would be so, so grateful for your support to keep it going. By becoming a Patreon member, you can not only help us cover the cost of this podcast, but you can get some really great bonus content as well. We post video tutorials, behind-the-scenes recordings, and bonus segments from our interviews. We would love for you to join us by going to patreon.com slash talkingwithtech. That's patreon.com slash talkingwithtech. Gotcha. Okay, let me try and summarize that for what I, what I heard you say there. So one thing is, if you're going to use Giphy, realize that some of the GIFs might be too fast, and they don't really, they might not necessarily represent what you're trying to represent. Um, so you have to, if you're going to use it, using it as, as a teaching tool, tying it to the symbol that that might be, the, because chances are the student is probably using a static symbol on their AAC right now, right? right? Um, and what I'm also heard, so is that fair, what I had my description yeah. there? Um, so it's a teaching tool that you can use, but understand you might need, um, that it's just one one tool in your tool toolkit. And then the second would be that potentially in the future, there would be, uh, well, that sounds like there might be animated symbol sets right now that I'm not aware of. You just mentioned a, a few, but they might become more commercially avail available and there might be future settings that would allow you to speed up or slow down that animation. So if you feel like you wanted to, um, that you said the pushing of the boulder, well, let's, let's make that go really slowly and let's, let's, we can actually maybe adjust the setting to make it go a little bit slower for some students and other students. Maybe we can make it go faster. Is that uh, a fair way? way or is that my am i thinking of that right yeah i mean we're kind of getting into multimedia learning literature so so how do people learn you know more complex constructs and the other piece about about gifs is that they're often paired with text and that's a problem in multimedia learning literature their their animation research is saying that if you pair text which is visual in nature Right, it's coming in through that visual modality and you have to interpret it. And then you also pair it with the animation. You're uh, engaged in two visual modalities explaining the same thing. So the processing requirements increase dramatically. And so for some of our kids who have those complex communication needs, I don't really want to increase the amount of processing required. Mm -hmm. Right, so you know, for anybody who's interested in truly implementing animation, but I would really encourage you to go look at Bernie and Betrancourt 2016. They have a, a meta-analysis of multimedia learning animation. And so that's where they define the four purposes of animation, the, the caveats associated with it. And we've talked about shallow processing or shallow understanding. Like, well, obviously I see this symbol for, for push and all well, that makes sense, right? But can they truly use it? Um, you know, they also talk about the, the text issue that we had just talked about. They talk about pairing um, audio with animation that, you know, that tends to be uh, a little bit better. Uh, one, because you have the, the input modality is different. You have, you have the audio information and then the visual processing information, uh, two different channels that allow for kind of maximum interpretation, maximum processing. Um, this sort of aligns with what I've heard um, and re research that I have uh, that used to talk about captions. So uh, just turning the captions on your TV, um, multiple mo modalities, right? Are you seeing the text paired with the audio and you're seeing that, a that action? Um, and so that sounds very similar to what you're saying this research points to. <laughs> yes, I'd say that's 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 fair to say, right? We're we're kind of we feel like we're we're on the right track of confirming what multimedia learning literature has confirmed. However, again, I mean they've been doing it for four decades, maybe a little bit longer, um, you know. And with technology changing, they're just much faster than we are in in AAC, frankly, because there's there's more researchers. 
Right, right. So, okay, so um, sort of bringing this to a head here, let me ask, so what are some some words of advice, either um, do this or don't do that? What kind of advice would you give or words of caution would you give who are who, to people who are thinking they want to be implementing um, animated uh, animated symbols? So you have to adhere to the four purposes of, of animation from Bernie and Betrancourt. You're attracting attention, conveying information about a process, uh, completion of a procedure or demonstrating changes over a time. If you um, aren't meeting one of those animation purposes, and, and let's say you're using YouTube, right? There's an entertainment value there. That's not a purpose of animation. You have to be very careful when you're selecting animation from, from YouTube, Giphy, and those different things. Um, the other piece is that, you know, we, we know that if you put a bunch of animated symbols on a screen, we're just going to kind of wreak havoc because it's it's very difficult to see 20 things all moving. And as humans, we are terrible at processing information in a grid, right? We use it out of convenience, um, but it, we aren't very, we're not very good at it. Uh, and the other piece is, you know, using animation and specifically for verbs and prepositions to to get the nouns for free, right? Start with the verbs. The nouns come for free. And then the other piece that I don't think we've really gotten a chance to talk about yet is that in that receptive syntax study, we also looked at word frequency data, and, and we also looked at um, imageability. And so imageability and concreteness. Now, when we look at word frequency, we're saying, okay, parts per million. So how many times does jump occur out of a million words? Uh, imageability is, well, how, how do I get to imagine that word in my mind. So highly imageable words tend to have higher ratings on this on this Likert scale. So I can, you know, let's say facilitate is probably like a 0.5, right? You can't really, on a five point scale, you can't really imagine that in your mind. But if you're saying, you know, jump, well, that's pretty imageable. Elephant, pretty imageable. Um, and then, and then concreteness, which we won't get into too much, um, but the word frequency and imageability, what we found is that low frequency words, right, tend to perform rather well in both the static and animated condition. Now we're a core vocabulary, you know, pushing bunch of professionals and we're saying no high frequency words. And I think this lends some evidence to saying, well, I can use low frequency words to teach high frequency words. So our data, and, and I have the, the data sitting up here in front of me, um, static low frequency verbs, 68% accurate in terms of labeling them compared to the verbs in the, the high frequency condition, 36% accurate labeling. Can you give me, give me two examples? Like you started with facilitate, is that, so facilitate would be a low frequency verb, right? And so that'd be a lot harder, and that's what you're saying, right? Right. So let me pull up, because um, I, I have four or five animation studies going and they're all, <laughs> all the verbs mixed together. What I really hear you saying as you're pulling that up is the strategy of descriptive teaching is where it's at. Meaning you take a uh, low frequency word, a word that we, we don't use that often, and you describe it using words that we do use more frequently. So when we always, when Rachel and I do our presentations, we give the example, um, and you've, you're, you're a dad, right? So you've got children, I always use dad jokes, right? So there's this molecule, what's a molecule? Molecules are very infrequently used fringe vocabulary, but you might see it a lot in science class, you know? Mm -hmm. So there might be a tendency for people who are not in the know to go run and put that on a communication device, right? So we say, you know, what it's a molecule, uh, small things, uh, uh, they, and then I make the dad joke, they make up everything, you know, um, but using those core vocabulary words or those high frequency words to describe that low frequency word. Is that what you're sort of getting at? Well, I'm kind of getting it from, from both ways, right? So you're, you're taking something that's low frequency, um, but ours are, you know, let's say in, in this study, blow, bounce, catch, cover. We're all, we're all very low frequency verbs. Mm -hmm. But what we find here is that those low frequency um, verbs are very easy to portray graphically. Right? Same thing with like some of the fringe vocabulary, you know, that we're using. Um, 
for, you know, obviously when you get into like molecules and atoms and things, it becomes a little bit more complex, right? But when we look at these high frequency verbs like close, cut, eat, uh, give, you know, those things become a little bit more difficult to portray, especially once we start getting like give, right? Who is giving, who's taking, you know, what, yeah. what is happening here? And so we see that low frequency verbs actually have better labeling accuracy than than the high frequency which is interesting so we kind of we can attack it from from both ways we're going to use the core to teach you know the low frequency but sometimes you're gonna to have to use low frequency verbs simply uh, because they're more imageable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? because you can you, they're easier to portray graphically and then i can i can find ways to use low frequency verbs to teach things like give or deliver like so you use the picture let me let me see if i can tie that together so you said like the word blow um i can easily picture a someone holding up a bubble you know wand and making this pursing the lips and blowing a bubble right and mm -hmm. you could use that to sort of uh as an analogy to teach the word give because you're you're giving your air to the uh, it's like it's to to the person next to you like giving it to the bubble right something like that right is that what you're trying to to, to is that what you're trying to say yeah definitely Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. As an analogy. All right. I like it. Anything else that we missed? We do have a, a study that we're, we're trying to get published right now um, that's looking at animation and sound. It's actually, you know, a, a study that's been done before in, in three-year-olds by Harmon et al. in 2014. And basically what they did was they paired um, environmental sounds with verbs. So, for example, clap, and then you'd, you'd hear the clap. But what they, what they did was they picked verbs that were uh, inherently difficult for kids to name accurately. So these were, you know, um, for example, spill. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to, to accurately name spill. But if you add sound to it where you knock over the cup and then the water falls to the ground, you hear that, right? There's another kind of form of iconicity. Yeah, right. So it's audio iconist and it's helping with that visual information. So if you're if you're thinking about overloading the working memory system here, you know, don't fret because we have, you know, dual uh, dual processing. Um, and so what we're saying is we're going to process the audio information of the water spilling and then we process the animated visual information and then we, we end up pairing them together. And what ends up happening is in, in three year olds, um, naming accuracy of the verb increases dramatically again 25 30 percent makes sense multiple multiple modalities right and so right. The, the more modalities you have the more information you have the more you can suss out what that word might be right yeah. it totally makes sense yeah. yeah and so we we kind of replicated and that's a loose term in terms of replication of the Harmon study but we used a slightly different design and we use four-year-olds and we want to say well does naming accuracy actually increase um and we found out that really at, at four, you know, there's a chance that it doesn't, right? Because as kids age, right, their semantic networks grow, things become more specific, right? So they may not need or, or take advantage of the audio information. Um, however, just because it's not significant doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's true, right? There's still a chance for error. There's a lot of different things that can go on in any research study. Um, but what we found was that animation and sound was not detrimental right they were animation and animation animated symbols with sound performed relatively equally i think there was maybe a percent or two difference and so you know for some kids they really benefited from the sound because we saw these really wide performance um, gaps where some kids were like oh man the sound and the no sound condition, huge differences, 60, 70%. And then other kids, just very, very slight difference. So from, from a clinician, you know, in terms of clinical implications, a clinician can say, all right, I will try the animation and sound, and I'm gonna see if it's beneficial in clinic when I'm teaching, you know, certain words like spill, clean, dry, um, vacuum, right? All these different kind of things uh, that would lend themselves well to sound input it makes total sense to me it makes total sense to me all right i i have a sort of a 
a wrap up question for you. And that is, you've got my wheels turning here. You had mentioned how the symbol sets and how uh, just humans in general, grids are bad, but we use them out of convenience, right? And I think there's um, some people that are, have been advocates for um, using picture-based sim- systems, right? Where it's an entire picture that you use and that the it's not a, it's not a grid, right? And I wonder about the synergy of what you're saying when it comes to sounds and um, animated graphics in a picture-based system as opposed to a graphic-based system. Do you have any sort of thoughts, you know, as a an image-based system? Yeah, so I think you're referring to like visual scene displays. Exactly, that's exactly like what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of good work that is starting to come out on video visual scene displays. And I remember having this kind of idea back at, at Texas Tech and thinking like, well, you know, at that time I was studying persons with aphasia and I still do. It's like, well, what if I took a video camera and I walked down, you know, this this client's Walmart and because they wanted to go shopping, gather things together and I animated this aisle. So aisle one and, and you had some text that said what was on aisle one and they walk and they can pause it. Right. And so there's some there's some really good research that's coming out with kids and also persons with aphasia that video visual scene displays, you know, can really benefit, um, you know, a lot of these communicative um, outcome measures. And so I'm not, I haven't followed that line, you know, as, as carefully as, as maybe I should, because what well, my line is more in these, these individual graphic symbols, but so far from what I have seen and, and read, it looks relatively positive. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can use that visual scene display, either it's static or it's video based, you're providing a lot of context and what, what previous research is called these embedded semantic associations where, you know, I know that when I open the closet door, it's my closet door. I know what I, I know what's in there. Right. I know that I can connect, you know, closet and close right? just because those two are, are so paired. And so having that context, you know, in terms of like persons with aphasia, very, very beneficial. Right. We had a study in 2017 and, and we looked at um, visual scene displays and grid displays. And we compared them for a couple individuals with uh, non-fluent aphasia. And what we found was that the individuals with non-fluent aphasia actually had more complex um, multimodal communication in, in terms of complexity, like syntax. And, you know, with, with, and we're including everything, gestures, natural speech, words that they're pointing to on the screen and, and speech that they're, they're naturally producing. Their speech was much more complex in the visual scene display condition mm-hmm. than the grid, right? Because you didn't have to navigate. You didn't have to think about, okay, what was the question? Oh, now where do I go? Okay. I got that word. What's my next word, right? There's a lot of internal processing going on that frankly we can avoid with with technology like these scenes video scene displays and also the animated symbols love it love it all right so the last question that i like to ask before we wrap things up is um but it sounds like you're already uh and maybe answered this but i always like to think um ask the question what are you sort of curious about when it comes to the future of AAC? What's kind of got your mind moving? Clearly, uh, I didn't even mean, mean to make that joke, but we got your mind moving. Um, what's got you, what are you questing after? I mean, what what are you trying, what's got you really, um, I don't know, hyped for the future? You know, a lot of different things. And I think that the biggest thing is, and, and it's really a kind of occurring all throughout communication sciences and disorders, and that's treatment intensity. Um, we are notoriously poor at measuring how long we see um, kids, or not necessarily like tracking that. I'm, I'm talking about we're notoriously poor at varying our treatment intensity. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening is that we see kids once twice a week in a school setting for 30 or 60 minutes. And we don't deviate from that. Very, very few. And I actually have, we have um, survey data that I'm, I'm hoping to get out here in January that shows that's what most of us do. Mm-hmm. But why? Why are we doing that? Well, you know, there's a lot of arguments that could be made, but I'd say the biggest blame should be placed on graduate universities programs. One, because that's what we do. One day a week, 30 or 60 minutes or two times a week, 30 or 60 minutes. 
And then we go out and we say, that's what you do. That's your job. And then a, a more, you know, other blame, I guess, can be placed on large caseloads. And it's just once you once your caseload gets so big, it's very hard to manage it. So you're just trying to survive as a clinician, mm-hmm. right? And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I got a third one. If you a third one would be yeah. the, the IEP system in general. Uh, mm-hmm. le, le, it's it's uh, a lot easier to write sixty minutes a week into an IEP than something more variable because if you have that variable, it makes it a little squirrely for everybody. Like, what do you mean you're going to see him for five minutes now and then 45 minutes later or something where there's some breathing to it, right? It's just, okay, we'll just write it down 60 minutes a week. And now it's come black and white concrete. This is what I know I need to do, right? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the ways around what you're saying is we'll, we'll set him up with, with that monthly minutes. I'm going to see him the same amount of time. That's not the issue, right? But in terms of treatment intensity, you know, we have the time per week, we have the number of sessions per week, but also the aided models. And this is where the AAC literature is very vague in a lot of studies where they don't tell you how many models did I give this child in order to make progress on said variable. So let's take uh, Binger and Kent Walsh, Dr. Dr. Binger and Kent Walsh. And they are saying in their AAC protocol, right? we're gonna do 15 minutes, but I'm going to give this kid 30 aided AAC models in 15 minutes. So that roughly equates to two per minute. And so in our, in our survey data that we found, the majority of people are giving 20 or fewer aided models. And when I say the majority, I'm talking about like 75% of people in a 15 minute session are modeling one, two times a minute. Wow. Right? And so I would have expected it to be higher by now. Like meaning yeah. we, <laughs> so many of us have been banging that aided, ma- aided language stimulation drum for so long. I would have expected to be, to see higher, higher numbers there. Yeah. And then a lot of people are simply just not tracking it. Mm-hmm. So if you take all of these kind of features, the, the number of minutes you're going to see somebody a week, the number of times, the aided models, and then also you can say, okay, well, the trials, right? How many trials of two symbol utterances are they performing in a 15 minute period? And we're just trying to get business as usual practices because we honestly don't have any real solid data that says this is what's happening. Now, again, it's survey research and it's an estimate and there's confirmation bias and there's other things. But in terms of a starting point, right, treatment intensity and where it should go in the next decade or two, I think it's going to be really, really important because we're spending a lot of of Medicare, Medicaid dollars um, on these things but we're not manipulating specific variables that could get these kids off of caseloads faster. So that's good, one, for Medicare, Medicaid, but two, and, and, and most importantly here, it's great for the kids and the adults. More communicative competence in, in a uh, shorter timeline, right, is absolutely beneficial. And so that's where, you know, I'm, I'm coming from work, work less, use the technology, use the data, you know, but right now with that treatment intensity piece, you know, there's just not a lot. I wonder, uh, and I wonder that um, Rachel and I have really, again, been saying a lot here during uh, the pandemic, since the start of the pandemic, is will we see a shift? We saw a shift um, uh, towards coaching families at home because they were at home, right? And so let's give the com- the, the communication partners. And what happens, again, I think would be great survey data would be, uh, how often do you see a new speech therapist in your in the time from let's say preschool to the time you leave the end of the public school? It's probably I was just throwing a dart at it. Probably eight to ten different speech therapists, you know, depending on where you live and mm-hmm. changes. But you have one parent, you know, that is probably consistent, or two, you know, and your family members are consistent. So if you were going to spend your time, your minutes, will you get a bigger bang for your buck as a speech therapist working with those communication partners and teaching them? And seeing that, right. like, let's do a a lot of time up front with these communication partners, as opposed to that sixty minutes a week with the individual student. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I absolutely love it. I mean, who's going to spend the most time with these kids, the, the caregivers, and and it's not necessarily the special education teachers either. It's the assistants. Mm-hmm. It's whoever is helping the sped teacher, and targeting those people for for some very intensive coaching and saying, okay, today we're going to work on you know aided models and and recasting. 
And we're going to teach that and I'm going to coach you through it. So, of course, you have to listen to a little mini lecture, but then actually doing it, mm-hmm. right? And then in giving that specific feedback to those individuals to help them kind of grow, um, going to be absolutely you know, game changing or so, or so I hope I'm with, <laughs> I'm with you, right? Something's got to change with the pandemic. I think, I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to grow. I agree. I agree. So Chris, tell us about um, some research that you're doing and if do you need any help? Yeah. So I absolutely need as much help as, as I can get. So right now we're still in the proof of concept phase for a lot of our studies. And we've got about three or four animated um, research studies going on. Uh, so if you're interested, you can head over to isu.edu slash SLP slash faculty. And you go there, you can find a, a link and it will take you to a form that you can fill out. So again, we're looking for four to uh, six year olds And this is receptive syntax, navigation, and symbol sequence construction data that we're we're collecting. So if you can help out, awesome. So go to that website and um, what you end up seeing is that that link. And we actually pay you $50 in Walmart gift cards, or rather we would pay your children to buy some wonderful candy at Dr. Brock's expense, or maybe not candy, maybe something like a cool toy or whatever. But anyway, isu.edu slash SLP slash faculty, and then you find uh, my photograph there. Fantastic. We'll make sure we have it in the show notes. Uh, I'm so glad that Michaela put us together. I'm so uh, thankful for this research that you're doing. Uh, I'm very interested on how it all turns out, and uh, let's keep in touch. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, sounds like a good plan. Thanks for having me again, Chris. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks again, everybody, for listening to Talking With Tech. 